I'm your host, Sarah St. John. My guest today started a six-figure business through blogging, podcasting, and YouTube. He now helps other aspiring bloggers and affiliate marketers achieve financial independence with an online business. Welcome to the show, Chris Miles. Hey, how you doing, Sarah? It's nice to be here. I do appreciate your time, and I'm excited to, to, to chat because this is, this is my jam. I love talking about this kind of stuff. <laughs> well, I'm so glad to have you on the show. I've wanted to have you on for a while. But the first question I have, well, I want you to give more of your background story. But before even that, I'm curious what the story is behind being referred to as Benji's dad. Ah, that's a great question. So that's actually my son's name. All right. And okay. it actually does kind of tie into my, my origin oh, okay, story, sure. I guess, if you want to call it. But, you know, so basically just in the beginning, it was just me and my wife and we were doing okay. We had like okay jobs, but they weren't like the best jobs in the world, but they were paying the bills. We weren't in a ton of debt and stuff though, which was kind of terrible. I think around $30,000 or so worth of bad credit card debt, but we had to find a way to get out of it, but we were just making the minimum monthly payments. So we just kind of like just kept kicking that ball, you know, down the road. But eventually we found out that we were pregnant with our first son. He eventually was named Benji. And my wife expressed that she wanted to stay home with him full time. And I was like, man, we can't do that because she was making like around $40,000 a year at that point. I was like, how am I going to replace $40,000 into the house? So I went online and kind of did what most people do. Googled how to make money online and a lot of garbage and trash popped up. But I did eventually stumble across blogging and affiliate marketing. It wasn't easy. I'm not going to say it was like, it was every, everything was rainbows and, and pixie dust from that point. There was some ups and downs, but uh, eventually I was able to kind of figure it out. And about 18 months later, I was able to have her quit her job. And about two years later or two years into it, I was able to quit. And that was back in like 2018, 2019, I believe. So I was going on about four or five years of doing this solo thing. And it's been fun. I've been really enjoying it. And that's where Benji's dad came from. My wife gave me the idea, trying to think of a good brand to come up with. And she was like, why well, don't you just go Benji's dad? And I was like, I like it. So... <laughs> I went with it and uh, it kind of stuck and because it helps because I, I've tried to do the whole, I'm just a dad who just happens to blog kind of a thing. And it kind of helps with branding and all of that fun stuff. I love that story. So how did you start? I guess you did some research on ways to make, you know, money from home basically. And then you stumbled on, so did you monetize blogging right out of the gate with affiliate marketing or kind of what's your story there? Yeah. So, I mean, I really fell in love with the affiliate marketing business model, I guess you can say, because you don't have to own a product for affiliate marketing. You basically partner up with another business and then you can promote their product. So if you are the middleman or the middle person, you know, right there, you know, the buyer gets a product that solves their problem. The manufacturer is able to sell a product so that they can make money on it. And then I'm the one in the middle that kind of makes a suggestion. But if the product, they don't like it or it doesn't work out, when they return it, if they return it, they don't have to, I don't have to deal with them or how to use the product. If there's problems or issues and they got to figure it out, they call the manufacturer, not me. Yet I still made a commission from it. And in a lot of instances, you can make what's called a recurring commission from it over and over and over again for as long as they remain, you know, a member or whatever at the, at the service or product that they happen to be using. So I really like that business model because I could find products that I liked that I used regularly and it just simply say, Hey, if you want to use it, this is what I use every day, then you should probably check it out as well. And then using it as a recommendation, then you end up making some pretty good money with it. But the problem with that business model is that, especially when you're on YouTube or TikTok or wherever you happen to be getting most of your information from, they say how great affiliate marketing is, but then they always leave out the idea that you need to get traffic to this place. You need to get people there. Cause if you can't get the right eyeballs on it, then no one's going to buy anything. Right. You can't sell a stethoscope to a group of, of lawyers. It has to be right there in line. And then that's where blogging came in because you can create the treadmill of going on, posting on Instagram and Facebook and annoying your friends and family constantly. Hey, go buy my stuff and yada, yada. Or you can do what's called attractive marketing, attraction marketing, creating content that people are naturally looking for. And then when they find it, you help them out of their problem or jam. And then you suggest a product that they can actually go and buy at which point you get an affiliate commission for. So I got big into blogging, SEO, search engine optimization, specifically from Google, writing blog posts that are nice and helpful. I'll probably build a website that has one or 200 posts on it, but didn't have direct monetization with affiliate marketing. And then once it's built and it kind of treks on its own, I don't have to do too much. It's kind of like building up a house brick by brick, but once it's up, 
you know, you change a lock here every now and then, you go fix the shutters. So I'm doing like more maintenance on it. So that's kind of how the blogging and affiliate marketing kind of married each other in my life. Oh, so you have full sites then I guess on big topics or something and then write blog posts on that topic and have affiliate links, you know, within that blog post. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So okay. I'm a, I guess you can call it, you know, you have blogger. Everyone says, oh, I'm a blogger. People, that's what people said back in 2009. So a lot of question I get all the time is, hey, isn't blogging dead? I mean, you know, it still existed. No, it's not dead. It's just changed. <laughs> so the way that it's changed is that you need to create content that's helpful for a particular audience of people. The way Google works is they're trying to answer questions as quickly as possible. So, but they get the answers from us, the bloggers or the content publishers. We create the content looking for what we call keywords or topics that we can create the content on. And then as people look for them, hopefully our websites pop up, we get the traffic and then we can monetize usually a number of different ways. I like to focus in on affiliate marketing and I do pretty well with that. So I will pick a topic and I'll create a website on it and run with it. And then I usually get it to a point to where it's making a few hundred dollars a month, a few thousand dollars a month. And you can actually turn around and sell that asset to somebody else. And then they can buy the website and then they can continue working with it because this website's making that money every single month. The real money in that is the exit. You know, just like with any business, if you can exit that business, you're going to get a nice rich payday. And that's really what I do. I try to build up the sites and then build them to a point to where the, an investor would be interested in it, invest in the site. I take the money and then I repeat the process in another niche or another site. So how do you find someone interested or do they contact you? I'm a little of both. There are marketplaces that you can go to that will have curated set of buyers that are kind of always there. Maybe they're part of an email list. Specifically, there's places like Empire Flippers, Motion Invest, FE International. There's different Facebook groups that are always, you know, buying and selling websites. They're really, you know, assets because they're, they're things that are generating revenue, right? And they generate revenue pretty consistently and you don't have to worry about a whole brick and mortar store and then training people and then having to be their boss and all that fun stuff it's a website so everything is online and it makes it a lot easier for an investor really if they have the money they want to park and maybe they don't want to put it in stocks or stock market or something and they want to buy a business because they want to get some of the tax benefits of it they can literally just buy the website which is a biz business within itself so you go to these places and that kind of, they kind of puts together the buyers and the sellers. And at that point, it's just, how can you structure your site in a way to make it easy to pass on to somebody else so that they can continue making money with it and have the option to grow it as well. That's really interesting. I mean, I've heard of that before, but I hadn't really thought much about like how people go about doing that. So I'm curious, how many websites have you created with this model? And then how many have you sold? Yeah. So create it. Man, a, a number, a number of them. I can't even think really how many I've created. Probably in the realm of 15 to 20, if not more. And, and sold only about maybe six or seven. So going with that, with those numbers, you know, you would think that, oh, that's not big numbers. But the way that it works is how much money a site generates each and every month. You can, it can be sold at a multiple of that, right? Just like a business would if you're selling a business. So if a site generates a thousand dollars a month, it's usually valued anywhere from 30 to 50 times the amount of money in which the site is worth is generates each month. So if a site makes a thousand dollars, it's worth anywhere between 30 and $50,000. And that's just like a projection for the buyer. So, you know, they would kind of invest in how consistent the site is and will continue to be. And then in three years, they'll be profitable with it. And that's if they don't grow it at all, if it just stays consistent then they're going to end up breaking even at three years. And then at that point it becomes straight profit, right? But if you find, if you go buy a site and then uh, you buy it at a 30 X multiple, and then you find a way to increase the revenue on it and then get it from a thousand dollars a month to maybe $2,000 a month, you're going to start breaking even within six months to a year. And then at which point you can, you're now all profit at that point. And then you could then sell that site and it's all yours. So that's a couple of options that, that you have. And that's why it's such a good lucrative business model. It is risky, just like any investment would be risky because you are kind of at the behest of what Google is going to treat your site. But when you follow practice and don't give up on the site and just let it actually sit there and grow organically, then they're very, very stable asset. So now when you sell, sell one, I guess you have to like switch over all the affiliate links and whatnot. What, what is that process like? 
Yeah. So there's like a whole audit process that I go through when I acquire a new site. It's really all on the buyer, you know, to figure out, okay, what I need to do to switch the things over. So for example, if I'm looking at a site and I see that it's being monetized with Amazon, for example, there's a specific little piece of code or within the URL of the affiliate link itself, that if you just change that, it'll change the attribution for that particular product that's been sold. So if someone clicks on it, Amazon knows that they came from my website. And if they do make a purchase within 24 hours, then I'm going to get a commission for the sale. So when I acquire a new site, I have tools that I use that can literally look for every Amazon affiliate link on a website and then change it over to my code. And I can do that within a button press. If they are in with, if they are within other affiliate programs before I acquire the site, I need to make sure I can into those affiliate programs because otherwise, then that would be a missed opportunity, obviously for trying to make more revenue with the site. But so whatever monetization strategies that the previous owner was using, you need to make sure that you are in those same places so that you can continue to get that money. And I think it works even better than, you know, maybe renting a house or something, right? Because you have to buy the house, then you got to probably fix it up. But then you also have to find a renter, which sometimes might take a while, you know, depending on, you know, how big the house is, how expensive it is and all of that fun stuff. But with a website, I can acquire a website today and by tomorrow, it's already generating revenue for me because I already switched over all of the affiliate links. So I'm getting an immediate return on my investment, literally the same day that I acquire the site. You just got to put in the work to change over the revenue stream. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then as far as getting traffic to the sites, you mentioned SEO. Is that the main thing or do you use paid ads as well? No, strictly organic. I don't run paid ads to my affiliate sites at all. And the big reason for that is because there's rarely an ROI on it because you need to have something on the back end that justifies the cost for sending traffic to the front end. And usually with an affiliate product, unless it's a high paying affiliate product, then maybe you might be able to get away with it. But a lot of sites that I acquire probably use Amazon as their primary way. And Amazon honestly doesn't pay that much, but that's actually a way that you can look at a site and say, Hey, I can increase the revenue on that site just by taking it off of Amazon and putting it on a more higher paying affiliate, usually going maybe directly with the manufacturer and working with them rather than just sticking with Amazon. And usually you can, you might be able to increase the revenue on a site 25 or 50% overnight just by changing over the affiliate program that a lot of people may not even think of. I, I call those like easy wins. You know, I look at a site, oh, they're missing this, they're missing that, they're not doing this. I can acquire that site and then do those things and literally double the traffic overnight, double the revenue overnight or whatever, or what have you. And then because of that, I can then be able to have that site worth more money and then I could sell it immediately right there if I wanted to, or I can hold it for four or five, six months get a little, make sure that it's consistent, it's consistently making more money and then I can sell it. So I'm essentially flipping websites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that idea. I haven't flipped a website before, but I've flipped a domain. Like I bought a Same domain. <laughs> yeah. I bought a domain cause I was planning on using it and then I just never did. And then someone contacted me out of the blue, like not long after I bought it. And I think I bought the domain for like a buck or something on one and one, but I don't know. I think it made like 500 or 700 or something. It was crazy, but uh, I've flipped domains before, but literally maybe a handful because you have to buy something and then find a market for someone to actually want it. And you're just kind of like, you, I think you just kind of was fortunate that someone happened to be looking for it around that same time. There is a thing that's called age domains. So uh, sometimes what happens is there's this business that existed. And maybe COVID or something took them out and they don't exist anymore. They're no longer in business, but their domain name still exists. So you can actually come behind them and buy that domain. And because it might have very interesting backlinks to it, and because it has those really nice backlinks, people will pay a premium for those backlinks. And if you're an affiliate or something like that, you can buy this old business that used to be, I don't know, maybe they were a pain reliever for headaches or whatever. And then you can take that website and then turn it into an affiliate site by selling pain relievers or promoting pain relievers as an affiliate. And because it already has the backlinks, it already has the authority from Google to say, Hey, this is a website that's about pain relief. Then that means I can create a site promoting stuff about pain relief. And it should be a pretty, you know, relevant line, which means Google will continue to give me the authority for that particular topic. 
which means I should be able to rank a little easier on Google and then get some traffic for it as well. So because of that whole process that exists, you can buy domains as they call, as they drop is what they call them. When no one renewed it for whatever reason, you catch it as it drops and you can turn around and sell it because of the backlink profile that it happens to have. It's a little into it and you need, need to, you need to definitely know what you're looking for when you're buying these domains rather than just buying the name, but it can definitely increase the value of a domain just by doing it. Yeah. And the price of domains varies so much. Like there's one that I actually want, but it's like $2,000. So I'm like, yeah. mm -hmm. so if well, there's it's a, it's all about supply and demand, right? <laughs> yeah. So if there's a domain that's available for sale, but it's just like, when you go to the domain, nothing shows up. How do you know if it was, I mean, obviously it was an existing domain, like someone bought it anyway, but like, how do you know if there's backlinks and stuff to it, if you can't even view the site? Yeah. So we have tools that you can use. Two tools in particular that I would use to vet domains would be ahrefs.com. They're a paid tool. You do need to pay to, to use them. I think it's anywhere from, I think it's $99 a month to $200 a month or so, depending on what level you want to come in at. But you can look at the backlink profile of pretty much any domain that almost ever existed. They're probably one of the best tools that are out there to find that. But outside of that, you can also use another tool that's called archive.org. You may have heard of the Wayback Machine, where you can look at what a website looked like 10 years ago or what a website mm. looked like five years ago. And by using that, you can then jump into archive.org, put in that domain name and see what the type of content that was on the site when it did exist. That way you can see what Google sees that site as being. And that'll give me an idea if I can create content on, on that same topic or same subject, which means Google should continue to give me the authority it was giving it back then. And by doing that, it raises the value of the site or raise the value of the domain. And then I could either sell it or build my own affiliate site on it. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. I'd heard of Ahrefs before, but I. I guess I didn't think about using it for that. So when building a blog or a site, do you recommend strictly going with WordPress or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I am a purist. So definitely you got to go with WordPress. I know there's other options out there like was that Wix and Squarespace and show it and all these different ones. You got to go with WordPress usually because WordPress is very modular. So it allows you to kind of grow with the site where a lot of these other ones that I just mentioned, Wix, Squarespace, all of those places, they are very proprietary, right? And then it's tough when your site actually starts to grow because you're taking up bandwidth and maybe you can't hand, maybe the site that you're like Wix or Squarespace can't handle all of that traffic. So they end up charging you more money. So even, so usually at the end of the day, it's cheaper long-term to go with WordPress to build up your site. There's a much more customizable feel that you can bring to it versus going somewhere else that's going to end up charging you a lot more money as your traffic grows. Plus, it's almost impossible. Well, it used to be. It's a little easier now, but it's almost impossible to move a blog that's on one of these proprietary systems and then moving it to WordPress without it being just a huge headache or losing a lot in the transfer. So because of that, when you sell a site, it has a bigger upside to the buyer if it's on WordPress or if it's on something that they're familiar with. There's a bigger pool of people who are familiar with WordPress, so you might as well build your site on WordPress. And is it true that WordPress sites show up on search engines higher than whatever other websites? I don't know about higher, but you can customize your SEO a lot more granularly. Is that a word? <laughs> A lot more, you can do it a lot more, in a more granular fashion, I guess. I don't know. But regardless, you can get very specific with the SEO. And because of that, you can make it very easy for Google to see what your site is about, which makes it easier for them to present it to the right audience, right? So the whole idea is to make things easy for Google. And the more easier you make it for Google, the better the content that you put out there that's actually helpful to people, then the easier it's going to be for Google to surface your content when people are looking for you in your time. Then as far as affiliate marketplaces and things of that nature, you mentioned Amazon, which I've used. I haven't had much success with it because it's usually just like book recommendations. Yeah. But pay you much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I think what Amazon pays, I don't know, one to three percent or some some small amount. The thing that I like about Amazon though is the whole say someone goes clicks on your link, they don't even buy that thing, but they buy something else within 24 hours, like a flat screen TV you get commission on that. But 
you know, it's still, I mean, the chances of them buying a flat screen TV in those 24 hours isn't probably too likely. So whatever they do buy, it's, it's probably still. There's some logic that you kind of have to apply when it comes to that. For example, with Amazon specifically, yeah, they pay anywhere from on most of their products from like one to 3%. It's just terrible, right? That's, that's mm -hmm. really, really bad. Usually you can go directly to a manufacturer and make probably three to four times as much, if not more. I have one product in particular, Amazon pays, I think 3% on it. But if I go directly with the manufacturer, they pay 10%. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, so now just by changing over the affiliate link, I'm making more than what, three times the amount of money for it for sale. The only issue you have there is that so many people trust Amazon and will buy stuff in the blink of, a, blink of an eye anyway because it just happened to be in their cart. But the thing that you mentioned is what we call whole cart commissions. So someone can add a big screen TV to their cart, but then never go through with buying it. But then they happen to be searching for something, they land on your website, and then they click on an affiliate link that brings them back to Amazon to buy whatever product you are promoting within your, within your posts. But then they say, oh yeah, that's right. I had this TV in here. Let me go ahead and just check out completely. You are the reason that that checkout actually happen and they didn't just it didn't just sit there in their cart forever you know so you they do give you commission on that it does have to be within 24 hours which is another kind of drawback to running with amazon but amazon is a conversion machine think about it, every time you're on amazon you're looking for one product and then you as you scroll to the bottom they're going to say people also bought and it's like man i need that too so you start throwing more and more stuff into your cart they know how to squeeze the money out of you you know for sure but depending on what your topic happens to be you're going to be paid a different commission. So I actually just pulled up the commission fee schedule for Amazon. So the ones that are like televisions are 2%. Video games are 1%. Here's another one. Fashion, like women's fashion, that's 4%. But then if you jump into something like buying like headphones, like we use headphones for our podcasts and everything, musical instruments, outdoor stuff, you're going to get anywhere from 5 to 8% per sale on that. So if your niche happens to be doing tech stuff, then you're probably not going to get very much on Amazon for the sale. But if you have one that's in beauty or musical instruments or something like that, you get a decent percentage at 6%. But then you can also stack that with other affiliate programs. So musical instruments, for example, you can partner with Guitar Center and become an affiliate of theirs. I think they pay, you know, like 7 to 10% for sales that, that you drive there. And Guitar Center is a pretty well-known brand and people will buy for them online. And because of that, you can take advantage of the fact that Guitar Center knows how to sell online and then get commissions for that as well. So you can get really creative with it. I'd rather just send people wherever they're going to convert, to be honest. And uh, usually you can make more money with going directly with these brands and manufacturers than just using just Amazon. Yeah, a lot of companies and software programs and all this stuff, they have their own affiliate program. And then there's others where they're a part of like affiliate marketplace, like share sell or CG, CJ. Commission yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, there's a whole bunch of them. What are your thoughts on the affiliate marketplaces? No, those are excellent places mm -hmm. because they kind of tailor a lot of the stuff that you're looking for, depending on your niche. So when you start a blog, it's very important to talk about one thing. There's an old marketing phrase out there that says, if you try to talk to everybody, you end up talking to nobody, right? So you want to be very specific and niche. That's why there's a cooking channel, right? That's why there's a cartoon network. What kind of person is watching that content? Someone who enjoys cooking, who enjoys cartoons, or whatever it happens to be. So you know what type of products to promote to them. So within your website, you need to be very niche and specific as well. And because of that, you can then go to these marketplaces, search your niche, and then figure out what types of products that are out there that you can perhaps promote on your website. Running a, an affiliate program from the business side of things can sometimes be a little bit of a daunting task because most of these businesses, they're not marketers. They specialize in whatever it is that they're doing to generate money for their business. So they'll go to a share of sale or commission junction to sign up and let them run their affiliate programs for them. So because of that, they get these huge, huge marketplaces of businesses that you can now partner with just by searching golf. And now you see all of the golf affiliate programs that exist within these programs. You sign up, they give you a special link that you can put onto your website. When people click on that link and make a purchase, you get a commission for the sale. And what are your thoughts on like ClickBank and JVZoo? It seems like those are like more maybe software, but more like courses and stuff. Yeah, they're all digital products with ClickBank and JVZoo and all of those. And with these digital products, 
that's the way I like to do things is going after digital products, not necessarily on ClickBank because a lot of the products on ClickBank are a little, yeah, a little iffy in my yeah. opinion, because they just let anybody there. But a digital product typically can pay you more per sale than a physical product can, right? So, you know, just for your spitballing here. So talking about musical instruments earlier, I get paid 6% on that, but you got to think about it like critically, right? So a website that exists, that runs, that talks about musical instruments, hopefully they have a lot of affiliate links on there. So then people go buy and they'll buy a $300 truck or something. You only get 6%. Well, the reason you only get 6% is because someone had to create that trumpet, right? They had to build it. Then they had to store it somewhere until it was ready to be sold. And you had the people to pay to store it. You got people to pay to create it, all of that fun stuff. So there's a lot of overhead in creating an actual physical product. However, with a digital product, you only really need it to be created once. And it doesn't need to be sitting in a warehouse somewhere. It's just sitting online, ready for anyone to purchase it at any moment. So because of that, the margins can usually be a lot higher, so that they can give more money per sale. So a digital product, instead of getting a 6%, like a physical product would, a digital product might get you anywhere from 30, 40, or 50% per sale. And if the product costs 500 bucks, that's, that means every time you make a sale, there's $250 in your pocket from one sale. And uh, that's how you can really scale this business into something that can replace your income. Yeah. Or like you had mentioned earlier, recurring. So or like recurring, if it's a yeah. software thing that's say, let's say it's like a hundred bucks a month and they pay 50% commission, then you're making yeah. 50 bucks a month as long as that person is a customer. Yeah. And if you do that for enough, you don't have to, I, I believe it's what, 50 bucks a month, the number you just threw out there. You sign a hundred people up. I think that's like, what, a 60,000 or so year income mm -hmm. right there. So you're telling me I'm a hundred people away from making $60,000 a, a year. Like that all of a sudden it doesn't seem that, that daunting of a task, right? Mm -hmm. um, because you usually, when we look at social media and we look at how much traffic our websites are getting, you know, you might think, oh man, I need thousands or millions of subscribers to really make a lot of money. Well, no, you, you don't. There's a old theory out there by Kevin Kelly called the thousand true fans theory, where you just have to find a way to convince a thousand people for you to make a hundred dollars off of a thousand people. And that's a six figure income. That's not out of the realm of possibility. And with recurring income and the way that social media has kind of leveled the playing field for everybody, I know YouTubers who have huge, huge followings and they got celebrities who can barely get a few thousand on there because it's just a whole different brand and, and way to create the content. I, just, I don't know. I, I talk a lot, but I know this, this one last <laughs> thing. When the pandemic first started, right? You know, I was already on YouTube at the time, but because no one could do anything in the studios anymore, they had to go online. And I remember when they first started creating content online, it was cringeworthy. It was tough because they didn't have an audience to feed back on to continue, you know, having a laugh track, you know, if we're in the middle, they had to create all of that engagement themselves while they're sitting in their attic or in their basement or something. But I have been creating YouTube videos at that point for years. So at that point, I was better than these multi-million dollar qualities who had no idea how to create content on YouTube. But now it was a level playing field because we're all on the exact same plane. You just have to learn how to create content, whether it's blogging, YouTube, podcasting, whatever. Just a few people to invest in something that you believe in, that you like, and you can use affiliate marketing and scale that to a full-time income. Mm -hmm. And yes, yeah, so we've been mainly talking about affiliate marketing through blogging, but I'd like to hit on, since you mentioned it, like YouTube and podcasting, because you could yeah. use affiliate marketing through those avenues as well. Now, with, so with blogging and even with YouTube, you can have, I mean, a clickable link, basically, of course, podcasting, not so much. Yeah. You'd, you'd want to create like a, a pretty link, so to speak, where yeah. It's like your website.com or your podcast website.com slash whatever the thing is that, you know, links to the actual affiliate link. But I guess what has been your experience as far as when you compare blogging, YouTube and podcasting and using affiliate marketing through all three channels, what have you seen to be the most successful? Yeah, that's a great question <laughs> because of all the different ways that you can create traffic, pretty much every social media network. It's a way to generate traffic to your offer, right? So you can do this on TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, whatever. I have found that the most consistent ones are blogging, YouTube, and podcasting. So of those three, which one is the best? I would say YouTube will get you there faster 
but it is a treadmill. You do have to continue creating content over a, a decent amount of time for you to get that ball rolling. And then if you ever stop posting, it does wane over time, but it lasts a decent amount of time. Podcasting is kind of similar. It's harder to get podcasting ramped up though, because you know, I mean, not a lot of people know to just search your podcast, right? There's not a, what's called a discovery engine for searching for your kind of stuff. You need to kind of promote it yourself, but then usually word of mouth and then doing podcast interviews and all of that stuff can eventually get your podcast to the point to where you want it, to where you're getting a decent number of downloads and you're in people's ear for like 30, 45 minutes usually. So it's a lot easier to build that trust that you can usually sell maybe even higher price products you know, depending on what you're going with. I particularly still enjoy blogging because content that I create in a blog can usually rank for years. I'm sorry, I have blogs that I created back in 2017 that to this day still ranks number one and still brings in revenue. I don't know how many asset classes out there you can invest in it once and it literally pays you still, what, what are you, almost six years down the line. It's not as much as it was back then or if I stuck with it, but it still generates revenue. And I get an email every time a sale is made and I still get one of those a few times a week and I haven't touched that website in literally years, you know? So I do enjoy blogging. It's just as bad as podcasting because it does take time to wrap up. But once you get to the point to where Google trusts your website, that's usually a pretty passive way to get traffic to your site and to your offers. So I would say probably blogging first for sustainability, YouTube to go quicker, but podcasting to be a little bit more one-on-one. -on -one. So whatever you're, you like doing, what you enjoy doing often, whether it's writing, creating video, or just talking, find one that you really like, and then just keep doing it for a long time. And you'll be able to develop an audience just by being there and being available and being consistent. And by doing that, then you can send people to any of your own offers, to any affiliate products. If you have an audience that's interested in something so that you can partner with other people and say, Hey, I have an audience that's interested in candles. You know, I can promote to them if you want, but just pay me some money, you know, <laughs> kind of a thing <laughs> and w different ways that you can monetize just growing an audience. Yeah. And one thing I thought of doing is like product or so more, more like software reviews and recording it video to put on YouTube, but then taking the audio from that, putting it into a podcast and then you know, creating a blog post out of it. So like all three areas with one thing, basically one review, so to speak, or software kind of recommendation. Repurpose. Yeah. Kind of like repurpose stuff, right? Yeah. I find, you know, everyone wants to kind of go down that, that, that Gary V way of doing things. <laughs> he seems to create all content all the time, but people forget he has a team of like 50 people who work with him that he can do that kind of thing with. For me particularly, I'm pretty much a solopreneur. I do a lot of stuff for myself. I do out a decent amount. But uh, it really just you know depends on what the product happens to be. I find that trying to create content on each one of these platforms, if you focus in on one and then go all in on it, then you you tend to grow faster than trying to spread mm -hmm. yourself too thin. People who create content on YouTube is it's a different way to create content and engage engagement on YouTube than it is for a podcast. Podcast you can be a little bit slower, a little more engaging because you're talking, telling stories, and all of that fun stuff. Where YouTube, you kind of got to be boom, boom, boom. And because of that, sometimes it doesn't translate the best. Mm -hmm. So if you can find a way to maybe just record your podcast and just let that be popular, but you may not be able to go after the super huge terms and everything that you might be able to get on YouTube to get some major traffic. But I think recording a podcast and then, you know, video recording it would probably be the best way to take advantage of two of those ways. Blogging is another thing because you have to worry about SEO, search engine optimization for Google. I mean, it's nice to just get the transcript of a podcast and just slap it up on your website, but it would be better if it was optimized for a reader online. Each one of these platforms is probably going to be better if you just focus in on one that you enjoy and then just stick with it until success. And then as you grow and start to have more revenue to reinvest into your business, then finding a way to maybe outsource the video editing or outsource the podcast editing which gives you more time to just create the content and move on. So mm -hmm. it really just depends on what you like, what you like doing, what you enjoy doing, because you're going to be doing it for a little while with no audience, you know, as you're building up your base. And if you can continue pushing through, even when no one's watching you, then it makes it a lot easier when someone is watching you and they have a lot of content to binge on. 
Yeah, those are good points. So when you're trying to think of a new blog or website, what do you look for as far as determining what what would be a good topic with a good affiliate products behind it? Yeah, so that's what we call like niche selection or niche selection, depending on what part of the world you're in. So when you're looking for that, it depends on, all right, if you're doing this for a blog, the type of research you would do would be a lot different than if you were doing it for a YouTube channel or podcast. Since I do mainly blogs, there's a few things that I start looking out for. So I look to see, first of all, how am I going to make money with it? That's the first thing I want to know, because I want to make sure that I have a direct path to monetization. If I don't have a direct path to monetization, then maybe I don't want to jump into that because that's why I'm doing this, you know, to make some money (laughs) with it. Why would you do it just, just for fun? I mean, some people probably do it just for fun, but to be honest, most people do it because they're trying to maybe replace their income with it, you know? So first thing I look for is a way to monetize. So if you're looking at, for example, the golf niche, everyone always throws out golf usually. So there's a direct path to monetization with golfing because there's tons of manufacturers out there. There's tons of digital products that you can sell with golfing. I would look at the audience itself. Do they have credit cards? You know, sometimes a question with, you might want to jump into the gaming niche, but if you're promoting to a whole bunch of 14 and 15 year olds, what are they going to buy? So that would be a consideration that I would want to look into the seasonality of a niche as well. So golf, for example, during the winter in the United States, it takes a little bit of a dip. Are you going to be able to with it while it's dipping, but then it starts to pick up back, you know, March or so, and then it rides all the way until about September, October, and then it dives again. So are you going to be okay with that up and down versus if you did like the kitchen niche, right? Where you're going to, you have a direct way of monetization because you have tons of products that could go into a kitchen. Kitchens are pretty interesting all year long. You know, the kitchens don't really take a dip. In fact, they go up. Like maybe during Thanksgiving, you might see a peak. You have air fryers you can sell, knife sets, you know, sinks. There's a whole bunch of randomness that you can do. Versus if you jump into a niche like one time I was going to jump into a niche in LARPing. You ever heard of LARPing, Sarah? Mm-mm. Okay. So LARPing is L-A-R-P, live action role play. You've probably seen maybe on TV or on YouTube or where people are like dressed up in like old English and they got swords and everything and they're walking mm-hmm. around the woods like they're actually in medieval times, right? So I looked at that way and said, okay, there's a lot of people who are interested in this. It's a pretty niche audience. And they're all wearing that stuff, you know, there's the shields and the swords and the helmets and everything, that stuff to buy. But the issue that I had with it is I did this research like years ago when LARPing was just becoming kind of, I don't want to say mainstream, but it was just becoming, there wasn't a lot of people online looking for it. So the traffic wasn't there for me and I decided not to jump into it. So that's a consideration too, is how many people are looking for this kind of thing. If there's not enough people looking for it, if there's not 50 to 100,000 people searching for it every single month, then it might not be enough traffic for me to justify it. Cause I'm not going to get all 50 to a hundred thousand of those people to my website each month. It's only going to be a small fraction of them. So that's another consideration. I would go to Google trends, just type in a topic and see, you know, does, does it go up? Is it going down? Look at it from a five years at 20 years. Is it consistently dying or is it a fidget spinner? Does it pop up really <laughs> quick and then immediately die? Diets are like that, right? So like Atkins diet was huge for like two years and then completely died. And keto right now is just going crazy, but you can look at it. You can look at it. It's slowly dying. It's not dying a lot, but it's, it's, a, it's not as popular as it was maybe three years ago. So that would be considerations that I would look to before jumping into a niche to make sure that it's sustainable. And that when I do present it to a buyer later, that they see a curve for growth. That way it would make them want to buy it, make some improvements to the site to try to get the money back on their investment as soon as possible. Yeah, those are definitely good tips to keep an eye out for. Kind of the last thing I wanted to touch on was about affiliate disclaimers, whether that's on the blog, podcast, YouTube. Some people are are like, do you really need that? But I'm pretty sure you do. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So letter of the law, yes, you need to have them. How much you should have them depends. All right. So for example, there's some people who say that you need to have an affiliate disclaimer at the top of every post. Most people will go to a blog and they'll see at the very top, it'll say, put a link on this page or affiliate. If you were to click them and make a purchase, we will get a small commission from the sale. But it's at no additional cost to you or something like that. But then there are others who might say that you need to, every time you put an affiliate link in a blog post, you need to say, this is an affiliate link somewhere around that blog post. So the issue that we have here 
is these are FTC regulations, and they want to make sure that people are not being taken advantage of. If I create a blog post, but a golf manufacturer gifted me the, go the golf club that I'm testing out, it would be wise for me to disclose that in the blog post itself that, hey, they bought this for me to test out, you know, something nice and quick. That way, a reader can know that, okay, he might be slightly biased, but I'm still going to read what he says versus someone who actually goes out there, buys it themselves. I spent my hard-earned money to buy this driver, and now I'm going to give it to you. You see how it kind of comes across differently. Really, you would want to disclose it. I have blogs where I don't disclose it at all. Maybe I shouldn't say that out loud, but I have some that I definitely do disclose it. It just depends on the niche and how careful you want to be. I actually have never heard of anyone really getting in trouble with it outside of making like income claims. And they, like this one's going to mm -hmm. definitely make you a million dollars overnight or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these places, you know, they'll have small print at the bottom. If you buy our services, we're not guaranteeing that you're making money. Or you're, their lawyers told them to put that in there, you know? So you don't want to have those types of disclaimers and stuff on your website. But I think just specifically, just to try to put a button on this, a little post at the very top that says some of the links on this page, maybe affiliate links is probably good enough. Okay. Yeah. Cause I'm like, okay, do you put it on every blog post? Do you put it on your footer? Do you like, I've tried a bunch of different things. Like even in my email that I send out, it's in the footer and it says some links might be affiliate links, except that usually there never is in the email because I'm sharing like podcast episodes or whatever. I, there might be within the show notes of that podcast episode but anyway i've been like overly cautious and like putting it in yeah show notes emails blog posts whatever and maybe i'm overdoing it i don't know but well that's a, it, it is kind of vague sarah like they don't really give you a ton of information on they just say disclose it and just leave it at that and you're just like okay well how much do i disclose do i disclose enough or do I disclose it too much i try to have fun with it sometimes so the one that's on my blog post that one's pretty standard but at the end of an email, I'll say something like, hey, I, I work really hard on these emails and I put in parentheses. I know sometimes it doesn't seem like it, but I really do. And, and some of the links on here might be an affiliate link, but it's just here to support the newsletter or here to support the business or whatever. And we really appreciate it if you, if you did buy these products based on my recommendation, actually click the link here and do so. But just remember, it's at no additional cost to you. If you're going to buy it anyway, then what's the difference? And Doing that way, sometimes people are like, oh, okay, well, he's having fun with it. He's being honest. He's being real. And by doing that, usually you can encourage people. Okay, well, I'll help support you since I'm going to buy it anyway. It really just, you know, it depends on what you to consider disclose with what the FTC regulations really want you to do. Yeah, and sometimes I even see just parentheses and it says AF link, like AFF link. Yeah. And that's all. But with podcast episodes... I guess if I were to say, go to blah, blah, blah.com slash whatever, it's a pretty link for an affiliate link. I guess I would have to disclose then on the podcast episode too, or at least I have then that that's an affiliate link or is it more just for written content? Yeah. You know, that's a great question. I'm more of a blogger than I am a podcaster. I just kind of play one on TV. <laughs> so what I do for that is I kind of do mention it. So if it is an affiliate relationship, I'll mention, Hey, if you do click it, it is an affiliate link, but. Again, you know, no additional cost to you. If I do direct people to my website to then click on it, I just close it on that page for sure. Mm. I usually add an extra step sometimes depending on an affiliate link. So I'll put an affiliate link, like I mentioned earlier, or like you mentioned earlier, really talking about pretty link where you can kind of change mm -hmm. it up and kind of redirect it to where you want it to go. I'll create a separate page on my site. That's then kind of further selling the click to go to the affiliate program and, and buy. So because of that buffer that I sometimes put there, that's an opportunity for me to put a disclosure or something right there that is an affiliate link rather than sending people directly to the affiliate product and then just hoping that they can convert the sale. I find conversions a little higher by sending them to that page first, mm -hmm. warming them up a little bit more and then sending them to the actual affiliate. Typically for me, I find has done better than just sending people straight to the affiliate, but it does give you an opportunity to disclose that it is an affiliate link. Okay. That's a good little tip there well awesome well i appreciate your time i've learned a lot and i'm sure i, I think this is a great way for, especially for someone who's just starting out trying to figure out how to monetize a website or how to have a side hustle or eventually quit their nine to five and just have extra money whatever i think affiliate marketing through whatever method you choose is definitely a good place to start for sure if not just keep going with it and your website is blogger evolution.com 
Were there any other last words that you had? Yeah, I, I would just say for people who are probably on a fence about getting started with creating content online, and I would say just start and fail forward. Your first blog post, your first YouTube video, your first podcast, honestly, it's probably not going to be that great. <laughs> and that's okay. That's kind of what I try to tell people. Just try to improve 1% at a time, the most that you do. It. So you create your first one, then find one thing that you can tweak or get better at, and then do that for the, the second blog post. And then find another thing that you can tweak, do that for third blog post. When you get to 30, 40, 50 blog posts, you're going to look back at your first ones and be like, oh gosh, those are terrible. And you're going to want to go back and try to update them. But I do that even now. I've been blogging now for like eight years. And even blog posts I wrote like last year, I go back, what was I thinking? I wrote this and I'll go back and change it up. But definitely say, just get started. You're going to get better with it. It's a muscle. The more that you do it, the better, the stronger it's going to become. And if you ever want to check out, you can check me out over at bloggerevolution.com. My podcast, Blogger Evolution Podcast, where we talk about all of this blogging and affiliate marketing, niche websites, all of that fun stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks so much for having me on. This was great.